my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Hado from Lehigh University, and he will talk about hybrid lambda with Prometheus. Okay, well, thank you to the organizers of this uh, very nice conference for inviting me. And I guess maybe as the last speaker of the day, I should be responsible for you know saying we should all maybe thank them, but uh, I, I, maybe some of them are here. I guess, well, thank you for organizing this. This has been a, I've had a great time. I've had a good time back in Miami. Um, Right, so I want to talk about hybrid Landau Ginsberg models. So this is um, stuff that I've been working on for the last little while. Uh, so what's the idea? So first, let's talk about just Landau Ginsberg models. So for me, um, any pair consisting of a quasi-projective variety Y may be smooth. I don't know. Um, equipped with a function W, so a regular function W, um, it's going to be called the Landau Ginsberg model. So these appear in mirror symmetry, I guess the topic of this conference, um, as mirrors to Fano varieties. So if F is Fano, is Fano, then one expects that the mirror is a landau ginsberg model YW. Um, so more precisely, if um, F is Fano and maybe, I don't know what the right letter for this is, maybe Z inside of F is anti-canonical, Then F minus Z, this is a log Clabia variety or a Clabia variety. Uh, this should have mirror given by some other Clabia variety Y. And so the function W corresponds to sort of going the other way, adding Z back. So uh, back to F, right? So there's some sort of compactification type thing um, going on here. So in terms of mirror symmetry, people like to talk about categorical invariants. So you can talk about Fukaya or Fukaya style, cate style categories attached to these things. Uh, categories. And mirror to the Fukaya style category of, of the Landau Ginsberg model YW, you should have the derived category of coherent sheaves on on F, sorry, I'm gonna mix this up all the time. I wanna use, I wanna reserve X as something else. So on F, um, and going the other way, you should have categories of matrix factorizations of the Landau Ginsberg model YW corresponding to maybe some sort of Fukaya category on uh, F, right? So of course, fixing the, um, the right types of data here, we can talk about other types of invariants of landau ginsberg models. I'm personally, I'm more interested in Hodge theoretic invariants than I am in sort of categorical invariants. But so here, here's a couple. Um, so you can take maybe the vanishing cycles or sheaves of vanishing cycles attached to uh, singular fibers. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, I guess there's probably some way to interpret these things in terms of mirror symmetry. Um, but, you know, for me, actually, I, I'm not especially interested in mirror symmetry for this talk. I'm mostly just interested in studying these things as geometric objects. And one thing you can do with these things is you can kind of think about these as maybe, you know, providing motivic type invariants. I'm not going to go into any detail on that, but I'm going to mention this. So the idea is really that I want to think about these somehow independent of mirror symmetry. And so the types of things that I want to look at are really Hodge theoretic invariants. So in order to talk about this, let me introduce, you know, good compactifications of landau ginsberg models. So given a landau ginsberg model YW, a good compactification is a, uh, a pair, so a good compactification. is a smooth projective X, which contains Y as an open subset, as a Zariski open subset, uh, such that if I let D be uh, X minus Y, this is a simple number crossings divisor. 
And so that when I take the, uh, that there's a, there, there exists a function f on x going to p1 with the property that if I restrict f to y, I just get w back. Right, so the idea is I want to sort of add a bunch of divisors to y, compactify it, um, and I want this to compactify to a map to p1. Right, so I should think about f as inducing also a rational function on y. So I can have different things going on here. So if I think about this in terms of maybe this, this boxy picture that I could have, um, you know, I have this is my this is my x. Then I down here I have p1, and I project down. So I can have stuff. Uh, sitting in, at infinity here, so I can have a divisor here taken out, and I can also have horizontal stuff taken out. Um, I don't need to take out all the horizontal stuff, but I can take out a bunch of horizontal stuff, and that can be my y. So y can be the complement of the, the stuff that I've drawn here. So maybe, you know, I have singular fibers here, step different things going on, smooth fibers, but y can be the, the stuff in there. Okay, so attached to a um, a uh, good compactification, I can talk about uh, a twisted Dram complex. So this is a, well, I can do it in a bunch of ways, but I, let, let's start with sort of logarithmic data. So the twisted Dram complex that I'm interested in is going to be the complex given by, so I'll take uh, the uh, complex of differential forms with log poles on D, and I want to attach to it uh, the differential D plus DF. So f is the extension here. Of course, this isn't going to work because I'm going to introduce bad poles along the uh, the pole divisor of f. So I'll just allow for arbitrary poles along the pole divisor of f. So here, pf is the pole divisor of f. Right? So it's in my picture that piece. Okay, so I have a twisted Dram complex attached to this, and I can. Um, I, I, I can put filtrations on this. So there's a very nice filtration that one can put on the uh, twisted Dram complex. So this is introduced by, I believe this is uh, Zheng Da Yu who introduced this, uh, starting with work of, um, of Deleen. Uh, so you can, you can impose the following filtration. So you have, you take uh, your, your, your Dram complex um, I let myself have the poles that I want. So, and then I uh, basically restrict the types of poles that I can have on the polar divisor of F. Right? So I do this. So for some rational value lambda, I do the following thing. So I have log D and then I just restrict again. So I'm gonna for be forced to, um, uh, uh, so maybe negative lambda, one minus lambda here, PF, and so on. Okay, so the fact that I'm taking um, the, the, the floor function here means uh, it, th this takes into account the fact that PF can have uh, integral multiplicities, which are not just one. I can have poles of higher order on these things. But if, um, if PF has only, so if, I guess, has only first order poles, We can sort of ignore the rational values and just focus on uh, the integral values of lambda. And I can get a new filtered complex, which is quasi-isomorphic to this, which is called the Kinsevich complex. So the Kinsevich complex is defined in the following way. So I'm going to call it omega p f for the, uh, the elements in this. So these are just uh, logarithmic forms. So these are going to be elements in the sheaf of logarithmic p-forms with poles on D, such that when I wedge with DF, I still have log, log poles. Um, on D. Okay, and so the statement here is that if I take the complex that I had before, this filtered twisted Dram complex with integral um, uh, grading, integral filtration, then I have a quasi-isomorphism. So there's a quasi-isomorphism of filtered complexes between the Kintavich complex with sort of its natural 
sort of the stupid filtration on it um, with the differential d plus df and the stupid filtration, uh, which I'll just call tau greater than or equal to whatever, and to this this uh, twisted drum complex. Uh, log d with pole filtration here. Uh, F lambda with the same differential. Okay, right. So these are generally this is sort of a simplification. I mean, the the Kinsevich complex is much easier to deal with than this twisted drum complex. So it's a it's a good thing to introduce. Another really you know nice property of this Kinsevich complex is that it naturally or more naturally underlies a mixed Hodge structure or a mixed Hodge complex. So Shimoto, so, so maybe I should mention that this, uh, maybe just a bit of historical stuff. So this appeared first in a paper of Kitsarkov, Kinsevich, and Pantev, and I think it was published 2017. Uh, this also appears in a paper of um, Eno Saba and Yu <clears throat> around the same time, essentially the same time. Um, okay, so this underlies a mixed Hodge complex. So Shimoto, a little bit after this, so the idea, I mean, that this, this Kinsevich complex underlies a mixed Hodge complex, and in fact, I'm lying a little bit here, I wanna get rid of this part of the differential, that's okay. Um, the idea that this underlies a mixed Hodge complex is sort of implicit in both of these papers here, Kitsarkov, Kinsevich, and Pantev, and Eno Sabayu. Um, but this was first sort of said explicitly by uh, Yoda Shimoto uh, around the same time. I think the paper was published in 2019. So he basically says that um, there's a mixed Hodge complex consisting, or well, whose uh, complex part, whose Hodge filtered complex part, whose complex piece is the filtered complex given by the Kinsevich complex with its uh, the, the differential D and the truncation filtration, the stupid filtration. And so the idea basically uh, going back to KKP, to Kitsarkov, Kinsevich, and Pantev is that what this is controlling is this is controlling um, essentially a limiting mixed Hodge structure of relative cohomology. This is a limit mixed Hodge structure of what I get by taking the cohomology of Y with respect to a the preimage of a fiber as T goes towards infinity. So I have a family of fibers over P1. I take the relative cohomology and I let it go towards infinity. And that's essentially the mixed Hodge structure that Shimoto constructs. So the Hodge filtration on this is relatively easy. If you want to just count the maybe dimensions of the graded pieces of Hodge filtration, they agree precisely with the dimensions of the graded pieces of the Hodge filtration on this relative cohomology. So that naturally admits the mixed Hodge structure. Um, and the weight filtration corresponds to the monodromy weight filtration on this relative cohomology. So monodromy weight filtration introduce, uh, induces the weight filtration on this mixed Hodge structure. Okay, so all the pieces here are sort of relatively easy to deal with. It, you know, putting them together into a mixed Hodge complex, you know, if you've ever done this type of thing is a bit of a pain, but you know, there it is. So how is this mixed Hodge structure, how are the pieces in this mixed Hodge structure expected to interact with mirror symmetry? Well, let's see. So the conjecture that Kitsarkov, Kinsevich, and Pantev make is that assuming that F is mirror to Landau-Ginsberg model YW, we expect that we have the following duality. So H um, uh, P of omega of F. So if I take the Hodge numbers, so I'm gonna be careful here. I have a big F down here um, and it's gonna be a little F in the bottom and those denote very different things. I apologize for the notational, uh, the poor notational choice. Um, I have HD minus P 
of omega, uh, and let's say uh, f, this is the Landau Ginsberg side. So this refers to, maybe I should write a w here instead, but that's not how I define the, uh, the notation for this thing. So this is q and uh, f here. Okay, so the Hodge numbers of this Landau Ginsberg model should agree up to the sort of standard uh, sort of flipping of the Hodge diamond to the uh, Hodge numbers of the original Fano variety. And um, of course, there's an interpretation for this monodromy weight filtration as well, which says that the, in fact, so this monodromy weight filtration comes from the action of the log of monodromy. So this is going to be a nilpotent operator, since I'm assuming that the uh, multiplicities of the boundary divisor are all one. So that we don't have extra multiplicities there. It's going to be a nilpotent operator. So the, uh, the log of monodromy Uh, log of yeah mo log of monodromy on the Landau Ginsberg mixed Hodge structure, which I'll just denote by writing x uh, h y w. So this is uh, Shimoto's mixed Hodge structure uh, should correspond to the cut product with the anti-canonical. Divisor on F, on the cohomology groups of F. Okay, so this should carry uh, data under mirror symmetry, assuming we have a homological mirror pair. It's supposed to be a consequence of homological mirror symmetry or something additional? No, this, is, this should be a consequence, essentially. Um, you, you can. So the Hodge theoretic part, the, the Hodge part above certainly, well, maybe that carries a little bit of extra data, um, but the bottom part definitely should be a consequence. Okay, so just to see how this works in an example, we can take the standard uh, mirror to P2. And so if you compute, so this is mirror to P2, So the idea is that the cohomology of this should carry uh, the same data as the cohomology of P2 itself, right? So you can draw the Hodge diamond of P2, right? Um, right? So that's the Hodge diamond of P2. And if you compute the landau ginsberg hodge numbers of this thing, you get, you know, in H0, you get zero, H1, you get zero, zero. And I'm just here drawing the graded pieces of the Hodge filtration you get, of course, the same thing flipped on its side, standard type of thing, H4. And you can go a little bit deeper into this and you can try to think about what the mixed Hodge structure is making, this, making up this whole thing look like. And so if I just take the relative cohomology, so if I take um, H2 of C star with respect to uh, just a fiber, so don't take the limit, just take, the, just take a fiber, so this is my W. Uh, what I get is a mixed Hodge structure that basically looks like an extension of mixed Hodge structure of an elliptic curve of, of this fiber, of H1 of an elliptic curve by uh, Q negative one, so the tape uh, twist of the sort of standard uh, rank one Hodge structure. And if I take the limit, well, okay, so maybe I'll, I'll draw a picture here. So what I mean, so you can sort of draw these nice pictures of how mixed Hodge structures behave. And so in this case, I can draw the first one sort of like this. So this means that I've basically taken an elliptic curves mixed Hodge structure and shifted it. And then I add the, 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 rat, the, um, the Tate uh, Hodge structure here. So this is the elliptic curve part and this is the Tate Hodge part. When I take the limit, this part, uh, sort of degenerates. And when these things degenerate, they sort of tilt. So the idea in this case is that that's going to turn into something of the following form. So I'm going to get these two green dots going to green dots like this, and I'll get a red dot there at the same in the same way. And right, so I sort of degenerate the the weight of this thing goes down. So the, in my diagram here, the Hodge filtration is sort of recorded by 
these pieces, and the wave filtration is reported by the diagonals. So here the Hodge filtration stays the same, all that stays the same, but the weight filtration changes. I now get something in weight zero, something in weight uh, uh, two, and something in weight four. Okay, so this is how the, the mixed Hodge structure changes as I go to the limit. And sort of, I, I get this, and the idea is now that the uh, log of monodromy acts on this thing by moving up uh, along here, just like the cut product acts on the cohomology of P2 by moving up like that. Okay. So, uh, relatively straightforward. So, of course, this is you know essentially describing what happens. More generally, we can do the same type of thing. Uh, you, you can prove that this the same duality holds for any I don't know uh, uh, Gorenstein toric variety. So this the same. So this this uh, well this this expectation of of KKP. I don't know if it's conjecture, but this expectation. So I can check that the Hodge number duality holds is what I mean. For lots of different things. So for uh, uh, weak Fano torque varieties, uh, torque varieties. So that is uh, crepent resolutions of um, even partial crepent resolutions of um, uh, of Gorenstein Tark Fanos. So this is essentially due to Batcherev back in the '90s. Essentially, um, there is also computations for Fano threefolds. And can you explain to me how that can be Batcherev? Uh, right. So. What I'm saying is that um, if you want to actually prove this, it's enough to look at an old paper of Batcherev and say he wrote down the calculations you need and you do a little bit more work. It's, it's essentially, I mean, I, mean I, I wrote down a formal proof of this, but like I don't want to give myself credit because it's Batcherev plus epsilon. Um, yeah, right. Um, so in these two cases, this is. Um, uh, this is due to uh, Cheltsov and Przelkowski. And the Del Pezzo case is due to Luntz and Przelkowski. Okay, so Victor did a whole bunch of work on this. Um, so what I'm really most interested in is computational tools for dealing with these types of hot structures. That's sort of the, the main you know, thing that I want to be able to do. So here's some properties that you can deduce relatively easily about Shimoto's mixed hot structures attached to a landau Ginsberg model. And so when I, when I attach this landau this mixed hot structure, I don't make any requirements on basically anything except for the structure of this compactification. You know, as long as Essentially, what I'm getting comes from a map to P1, um, so that the 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 uh, the fiber over infinity is simple normal crossings, and I don't have multiplicities that are above one in these poles. All of these things will hold. So this is nothing fundamentally to do with mirror symmetry. So independence of compactification. This is an easy one to explain. So this is that. Um, <clears throat> It doesn't matter. So as long as as a good compactification exists, we get the same numbers, or we get the same mixed Hodge structure. I'm sorry. Can you explain how this Hodge structure is defined? Um, not precisely. I mean, so so I told you what the uh, what 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 the Hodge what what the Hodge piece is this comes from the uh, Kinsevich complex with the stupid filtration. Um, if you want to actually get into the nuts and bolts of how you construct the, um, the rational part of this mixed hot structure, that's, it, it's essentially straightforward. Like you, you, you have Steenbrink's construction of the limit mixed hot structure attached to a degeneration and you have, you know, I guess Deline's construction of the mixed hot structure attached to the the total space of this Landau-Ginsberg model Y, and you take relative cohomology of that. 
So it's essentially built as a cone of two well-known uh, mixed Hodge complexes. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, so as long as these good compact, and so, right. So given that explanation, it's maybe not at all a surprise that this doesn't depend on which compactification. The, uh, that we get, Uh, is the same no matter which uh, uh, is independent of choice. Okay. Um, okay, so it's independent of compactification. This is a relatively straightforward thing, and this is the type of thing you would expect if you're familiar with these types of constructions. Um, we have, and maybe I shouldn't even call this cut and paste, and we have just like the standard, you know, behavior of these mixed Hodge structures with, that, with respect to morphisms. So if I have a map from one Landau-Ginsberg model to another, maybe on some small, uh, with some small um, conditions on how this behaves with respect to boundary divisors. So this is just a morphism. In fact, I can just maybe forget about the Ws here. So there's a morphism from Y1 to Y2 such that boundary uh, behavior is respected. It's because I want to restrict to cases where I have still um, low multiplicities on the polar divisors and such that uh, the pullback of W2 is equal to W1. So I have a function here, W2 on Y2 and W1 on Y1. We get a morphism of mixed Hodge structure. going from, and I'm just going to use the notation h star um, y1 w to denote uh, Shimoda's mixed hot structure to h star of y2 w2. And in particular, you have nice residue exact sequences, basically anything that you have for mixed hot structures attached to just varieties, this the, will, will work in this case as well with some restrictions on the maps. So in particular, you have a, a residue exact sequence. So EG, we have, so if I have some sort of uh, hypersurface living inside of, let's just say hypersurface living inside of a Landau-Ginsberg model, I'll get a residue map going from this reducing degree by one to H equipped with the potential function W restricted to H so H contained in Y a hypersurface, smooth, say. And sitting here, I'll have just my standard Shimoto's mixed hot structure here, YW. Right. So we have a long exact sequence like this. So standard types of things, you know, it's all what you'd expect. Nothing is is, is too complicated. We have this A1 bundle type formula, by which I mean that if I have an A1 bundle over a variety Y, and I construct the Landau-Ginsberg model on that A1 bundle by pulling back my potential function, then I get an isomorphism of mixed Hodge structure. So if, is an A1 bundle, And W2 is a good enough potential on Y2, we get an isomorphism from H uh, of Y1 equipped with the pullback function of W2 to H of Y2. Two W two. Right. So again, the standard type of thing that you'd sort of expect if you're familiar with how you know mixed Hodge structures work. So the last thing, which is not necessarily a property, and it's more just something I want to mention, is that if uh, if the function if if W from which is my regular function, maybe I'll call that a one, is proper. 
then the Shimoda's mixed hot structure behaves really nicely. Uh, satisfies sort of the expected dualities for something to be, you know, dual to the Hodge diamond of a smooth variety. Satisfies um, sort of standard sort of expected dualities, expected. By which I mean, if I draw you a Hodge diamond like this, you know, you have, you know, in this case here, you have sort of the symmetries that you'd expect. You have a symmetry across this diagonal, you have a symmetry across, uh, not that diagonal, this, this line, and you have symmetries across there. You have, you know, nice um, increasing invention. So if, if you sort of apply your nilpotent operator, your, your monodromy operator, it'll increase uh, uh, dimensions as you go towards the center. So it'll increase in dimension here, then it'll decrease. So the things that you expect from the Hodge diamond of a variety are true of the Hodge diamond of a landau ginsburg model. As long as you have nice compactification, um, just as a result of being proper. Okay, uh, so maybe so this this really behaves as you know the Hodge the the Hodge numbers of a smooth projective variety without necessarily being something that reflects the Hodge structure of a smooth projective variety. Um, this, this thing is supposed to be this category is supposed to be related to the category of this. Uh, um, I, I guess it depends. I mean, so there's there's the topological bit, and then there's the Hodge theoretic bit. So I guess I mean the rational structure I suppose should come from a Fukaya type category, whereas the Hodge structure bit, the Hodge filtration, I mean, should maybe come from more of a B side type construction that should come from. I, I don't know what that comes from actually. Um, so there are parts from, I guess, both sides of the mirror. That's what I'm trying to get at. And does it work in gradient with Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this should all work. I mean, essentially everything here should work just like you know normal Hodge theory does. Um, yeah, so one more comment, one, one more small comment, which is that if it's not proper, then you get an extra filtration on Shimoda's mixed hot structure. And this extra filtration behaves sort of the way that the weight filtration on the cohomology of a non-compact variety behaves. So if, um, if uh, W is not proper, then H star W or YW, is sort of like so admits extra filtration. And extra weight filtration. Okay. Right. So these are these are properties that I've attached to a Landau Ginsberg model. And so these are all sort of in some sense like you know motivic type properties that come from decomposing the landau ginsburg model itself, decomposing the total space. So what I wanna do now is I wanna talk about properties and ways to understand, you know, breaking up the cohomology of a landau ginsburg model attached to breaking the function part, right? So this is sort of a natural question to ask, if I can break up the variety and get these, you know, exact sequences and things like this, can I do a similar thing by breaking the function? So this is where I introduce um, hybrid landau ginsburg models. So, you know, I, I, I'm not, so, so I get this, uh, the word hybrid here, I think um, comes from, 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 from Tony. Tony likes to use this. And so this is where I picked this up. I think it comes from, you know, mathematical physics literature. Uh, Ludmill likes to call this a multi-potential. So I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm using the Tony notation. Um, so, a hybrid landau ginsburg model is just going to be a pair consisting of a quasi-projective variety uh, y and a tuple of regular functions. So just, you know, add more functions. So how do these things, how are these expected to interact with mirror symmetry? So again, the idea is that if I 
have a funnel variety and I have a anti-canonical divisor, which is now, you know, now let's assume that it has an explicit uh, decomposition into the union of other divisors. Maybe you can, you know, assume some positivity properties for these divisors, but anyway, um, you should have a, a dual uh, Calabi-Yau variety to the complement of Z in Y. So this is dual to some uh, Fano variety Y or to some um, Calabi-Yau variety Y. And each W, or sorry, each ZI should produce for you a function WI on Y. So the data of F and this uh, boundary divisor, this anti-canonical boundary divisor, plus this decomposition should produce for you essentially the data of a hybrid Landau Ginsburg model. Okay, um, so as far as categorical invariants go, I don't really know too much about you know, how, how this works. Presumably any sort of Foucault style invariant that you can build for a single potential should work for a, a bunch of potentials. I don't know anything about this. Um, so maybe this is more of like a question. So presumably, Uh, the the sort of Fukaya type invariants uh, categories. Maybe they have been defined, or but they should be something that people know how to do. Um, I don't know anything about, say, categories of um, matrix factorizations. I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about derived categories of singularities, um, but sort of the upshot of what I want to say today is that at least from the perspective of Hodge theory, um, I don't know if it's necessarily that interesting. I mean, uh, may maybe these, these categorical invariants are going to be interesting when you start to add more potentials, um, but from the perspective of Hodge theory, you don't get anything new except something. You get a little bit of something new. Uh, which is you get sort of extra behavior uh, that allows you to sort of pull data from the, uh, well, okay, I'll get to there in a second. So, okay, so these categorical invariants, these are left sort of as a question. Um, you can talk about a twisted Durand complex in this case as well, but sort of the natural thing to do is if you have a twisted Durand complex, just to twist it again. So if I'm going to twist my Durand complex, the twisting part is adding df to the potential. So I should just add, if I have two different um, different uh, functions on my, on my variety, say x, and I have a nice compactification with respect to both, I should just twist it by both, by, by both pieces. So if I have log d, I should allow poles along the polar divisors of both w1 and w2. I'll call these f1 and f2. And I'll clip this with d plus df1 plus df2. And of course, this is just the same thing as taking the sum of the two functions and looking at uh, the twisted uh, Duran invariance of that. So that's the natural thing to do there. Um, OK, so what I want to do is I want to sort of fill in the gaps for the rest of the story for uh, hybrid Landau Ginsburg models. Yeah, I, 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 uh, it might seem that it's equally natural because multiple Yeah. Uh, Does it matter which multiple you put or it's always the same? I don't know. Uh, I, I would assume it's the same, but I haven't, I haven't thought about it. Um, if, if, if Tony were here, I'm sure he'd tell you the answer, but I actually don't know the answer. Yeah. I, but I, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't yes. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So l let me talk about what happens when, um, when you try to build essentially the Kinsevich complex for several potentials. So I'm gonna stick to just two potentials because this is the type of thing where one potential sort of is fine uh, and sort of a separate case, but if you add two potentials and you add three potentials, you know, anything bigger than two is essentially the same. So I'm gonna stick with two because it sort of satisfies my purposes. 
So I'm going to assume that all my hybrid Lambda Ginsberg models have relatively nice compactifications, just the same way I had nice compactifications for my Lambda Ginsberg models. So I'm going to assume that Y is contained in X. Its complement is SNC, so D uh, is simple number crossings. And there exists F1 and F2 from X to P1. And more, moreover, uh, such, well, okay, so such that F1 respect, re restricted to Y is equal to W1, and similar, similarly for W2. And last thing that I'm gonna require is that when I take the product map, I get a map to, I get an honest morphism to P1 cross P1. So this is essentially the same as saying that the polar divisors of F1 and F2 share no common component. So that's a relatively natural uh, condition and it, it, it occurs in sort of natural situations as well, right? I mean, natural toric situations, you can make this happen, things like this. Okay, so there's a Kinsevich complex attached to these um, and I'll credit Sukju Lee. So, so this was a student of Tony's. Um, or he's, he graduated, um, is you can attach a Kinsevich complex to this in sort of the most naive way you can think of, which is that if I take the two functions, F1 and F2, uh, I can just define this to be essentially the intersection of the Kinsevich complexes for the potentials individual, right? Or more explicitly, just these polymorphic forms or with, with log poles so that when I wedge with df1 and df2, they have log poles. Right? So it's a very simple definition. And of course, you know, generally speaking, since this f has a pole, I could be introducing a, a second order pole. So re re requiring that log poles sort of persist is, is a real condition. Okay, so what does this complex control? Well, the theorem that Sukju proved in his thesis is that um, if I take this hybrid Kinsevich complex and I try to compute the dimensions in this uh, uh, of, of the, well, not the complex, but the essentially the graded pieces when you attach the stupid truncation to this complex is you get the Hodge graded pieces of, and I'm gonna ignore the example for now. You get the Hodge graded pieces of the relative cohomology with respect to the, 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 the union of the two fibers. So here, here's a picture of what I mean by this. So I can think about this, uh, the hybrid landau ginsberg model as giving me a map to P1 cross P1. And then I can take two different things inside of here. I can take the fiber of W1 and I can take the fiber of W2 and they give me two different divisors living inside of Y. So I take the relative cohomology with respect to what, uh, with respect to these two things, and I take the canonical mixed Hodge structure on that thing, and I get uh, the same thing as the dimensions of the graded pieces of uh, of this this uh, Kinsevich complex. Okay, I should be writing F1 and F2 here. Okay, so this is um, you know this is analogous to what we had before, where if we had a single potential. And we take the dimensions of the cohomology of, of, of these Kinsevich um, well, sheaves, um, then what I get is the dimension of relative cohomology with respect to a single fiber. Now it's union of two fibers with respect to different functions. Okay, so that's sort of the idea. Yeah. So, I mean, last time you composed the divide D in G1 and G2, and G1 corresponds to W1 and G2. There's some, I mean, previous slide. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, but, uh, yeah, this GI corresponds to WI and Y. So, okay, yeah. Is it, and there, what, how can I use ah. GI in? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, so, uh, so comment that I should make um, is the idea is that sort of in, right, so mirror symmetrically, the idea is that, uh, you know, each of these two things, this fiber uh, with respect to the potential function, the other potential function, 
if I take that, that should be the mirror to Z1. And if I take this fiber and I equip it with the remaining potential function, that should be the mirror to Z2. All right, so these, these should be like, you know, I should be essentially gluing together mirror Landa Ginsberg models of the pieces of the anti canonical. Yeah, that's a great question. Should have, I should have mentioned that. So that's sort of the idea here. And this is, you know, how, um, you know, what Sukchu was certainly thinking when he, when he talked about this. Um, so, okay, so the theorem is that <clears throat> if I have a hybrid Landa Ginsberg model and I assume that I have a nice enough compactification. What I can do is I can take a resolution of this compactified Landau, hybrid Landau Ginsburg model. Basically, in this picture, what I do is I take these loci here and I just start to blow up. You know, I blow up until. So if I just add these two potential functions together, I'm going to have bad intersection with the boundary. So I need to blow up the 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 sort of point at infinity cross infinity or the stuff above infinity uh, times infinity. Um, until I can get sort of a good Landau Ginsberg model, but that's sort of a technicality. So I can um, start. Do, I can do this process, and then I can produce what's uh, a, a non-degenerate, or I, I think I called this. Um, uh, yeah, so non-degenerate. In fact, this is uh, good in the in the notation that I had before. Um, so that if I take the dimension of the uh, cohomology groups uh, with respect to the sum of functions, I get the same thing as I had with respect to the two functions separately. Okay, so, you know, just to maybe sort of unpack this, the idea is that this tells me under the appropriate sort of statements about degeneration, things like this. So morally, this means that the relative cohomology of y with respect to you know, W1 plus W2 with respect to a fiber T. So I, I add the functions and I take relative cohomology of the fiber is the same thing as taking the total space and taking the union of the fibers. Maybe I should just write union here. Okay, so the idea is kind of like, you know, I can break up this potential function uh, into two different things without changing the cohomology. Okay, so a couple comments about this. So first is that as, you know, well, okay. Uh, using very similar techniques. I mean, I'm not, you know, this is not rocket science or anything here. Uh, uh, Chen and Yu proved a Kunith type formula or essentially what, what amounts to a Kunith type formula here. For sums of functions. So if uh, y1 and y2, w2, if these are sort of nice enough Landau Ginsberg models, you can just write what uh, the oops, HP uh, omega. So uh, for, if I have a pair of Landau Ginsberg models, I can take a product. Sorry, I, I should mention this. And I can take the W1 plus W2. And so that means the natural thing, right? I pull back W1 to the product and then W2 to the product and add them. So I can produce another Landau Ginsberg model from this data. So what Chen and Yu proved is so this is a special case of the case that I have above. This is the case where I actually have a product globally. The case that's above is sort of a product in a sense locally. So this is a, you know, I'm proving a, a, a sort of slightly more general version of, 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 of this, um, this formula here. So is that if I take the sum of the two functions and maybe I'll just write F1 plus F2. So in this case, so in this particular case where I have a product, this is the sum, you know, A plus B is equal to P and L plus K is equal to Q. You know, you have your sort of Kunith type formula. Uh, this is an A and L here, isomorphic, um, B, I got F2, K, right? Okay, so you have this Kunith type formula. And as a consequence of this, I, maybe I won't get into it into too much detail, but the idea is that if you know, uh, you know, that the KKP relation holds, 
the expected relation between Hodge numbers of a Fano and its Landau-Ginsberg mirror uh, for X1, or sorry, F1, F2 in their mirrors then the same relation holds for products. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like why these numbers turn out to be the same? Oh yeah, um, okay. So, Actually, I'm, I'm maybe going to explain this a bit more in the next slide if that, that helps. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit about the topology of what's going on here. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, maybe as a good follow up to this is that um, you, you, can, you can sort of look at what's topologically happening to the fibers of, um, of the, the different functions in play here. Uh, so if you have a good hybrid landau ginsberg model, the claim is that you have an embedded sort of homotopy between the fiber of the sum of the two functions and the union of the two fibers um, with respect to generic enough uh, um, values. So maybe I'll do this example before making a comment about this. So this is really sort of the more fundamental thing. It's not the relative cohomology that's actually an important part of all this. It's the fact that if you have this sum relation, and you have nice um, behavior of these two functions near boundary components in your variety, um, you just have that there's this, this nice you know, topological relation between this, the fiber of the sum and the sum of the fibers. Okay, so if I take, let, let's look at this example that I had before, I can build a nice hybrid landau ginsberg model by taking uh, the potential function that I had and breaking it into two pieces. Right, so I break off the X piece in the um, in, in the potential for the mirror of P2, and I have my remaining piece here. So if I take the um, if I look at what the vanishing locus of the first function is, that's just going to be a torus inside of C star, or sorry, it's a it's a cylinder, well, torus, I guess it is. Um, it's a torus. And if I look at what happens to the vanishing locus of this, it's just a pair of pants and these two things meet at two points. So I'm gonna draw this thing in sort of a funny way. I'm gonna draw it so that the intersection points are on some sort of boundary. So I've sort of basically, you know, I've taken these two things and I've truncated after the point where they meet. So I have these two things here. Okay, so this is the, this piece and this is that piece. And if I take the sum of the two potentials, x plus uh, y plus one over xy equals some, I don't know, t, uh, this is gonna be a three punctured uh, two torus. So what I get is just essentially the same picture with legs put on the end. And this is basically the proof, I mean, of this theorem. Again, it's not, this, this part isn't excessively difficult. I mean, this is all just, messing around with the topology here, right? And so this is a three punctured torus. So what you see is basically to go from the sum of potential functions, I slice off this bit here. And this part is just something that can contract to, to the remaining stuff. Sort of like that. Apologies for the terrible picture. Sort of like that. Nope, no, that was wrong. Okay, so it's something like uh, this. Am I going to draw this correctly? Yeah, something like that. All right, so I have these two pieces that I've sliced off to get from one to the other. Okay, so, and the comment is that this is a generalization of a result of Nemethi from back in the 90s. Uh, so Nemethi proved, there was a version of this for, you know, just polynomials. So I take CN with the polynomial F and CM with the polynomial G um, proved by Nemethi. Okay. I mean, this just goes back. So the, I mean, the idea for all of this 
you know, literally goes back to, you know, this Tom Sebastiani theorem. I don't even know that when that was proved, it was like the 50s or 60s, I assume, uh, though I could be wrong. Um, but the ideas go back a very long way. I mean, there's nothing really, you know, super complicated here. Yeah, so that's the complication here, right? So, so uh, this is a generalization of Tom Sebastiani in some sense, right? So the, the statement is that I, I'm looking at a global situation and instead of like Tom Sebastian and classically is like looking at isolated singularities, right? So it adds two functions with isolated singularities and says that topologically the fibers are, you know, essentially related in this way. Um, yeah, but, uh, but, but if, I, if I do think about this sort of more global situation where I to, do take f and g to be functions in different variables and I add them in the same way, that's a consequence of what I've did here. I agree with you that the result you say implies constructs. Yes. Okay. It, it, it somehow, uh, it does not seem like constructs. That, that's, oh. uh, that, that's fair. I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily need to argue that. I mean, it's. I don't know. Um, uh, essentially like this, I mean, I can, I can build an actual deformation of, uh, so, so what I do is I take, uh, I take subsets of the five of both of these two fibers and I build a deformation retract of the fiber onto them. And then I deform these deformation retracts to a deformation retract of this fiber gate. So the, the point is that, you know, like this, this gives a, a topological way of seeing why we have this isomorphism between relative and relative. Is that reasonable? I mean, so if I'd, if I'd actually drawn everything here, I would have like a cylinder going off here and I would have two things going off here. So the idea is that I take this sort of closed piece here, I, I contract all this down here and I contract these two things down here. And then I deform this to what I get by taking out these pieces. So there are opens or there are subsets of both fibers, which are deformation retracted onto. And then I deform the two, uh, one to the other. That's what I mean by this. Okay, so I think the more interesting part of all this Oh, and I'm close to the end, so that, that'll be it, um, is that, so you can extend this to an isomorphism of mixed Hodge structures in, in, an, in an interesting way. Um, so the theorem here is that you can construct a mixed Hodge structure attached to a hybrid landau Ginsberg model, which, okay, given what we've already said is that's not a weird thing, but, but the, the point is that this is a nice um, construction of a mixed Hodge structure. So, I can, I can construct a th such a thing. The Hodge filtered piece uh, comes from the stupid truncation on this uh, hybrid Kinsevich complex. So I'm gonna take the stupid filtration here and it has the following two properties. So I have an isomorphism between the, and I'm just gonna use this notation to denote the mixed Hodge structure attached to the hybrid Landau-Ginsberg model. This is isomorphic to the Hodge structure constructed by Shimoto, uh, uh, corresponding to the sum of the two functions, right? So the point is you have to sort of have a different construction of the underlying mixed Hodge complex here um, in order for the second uh, thing to hold. So the second statement is that I get a nice exact sequence and this exact sequence relates the cohomology with respect to the two potential functions to what I get by dropping one of the potential functions. Um, W1, so I can drop that potential function and I get a third term in this exact sequence, which is sort of weird to describe, but I'll use my remaining minute to do so. And I'm gonna, I don't know, use probably terrible notation. I'm just gonna write W1 over W2. And what this means is the following thing. So as I said before, you can sort of think about this as producing a pair of families of Landau-Ginsberg models. 
So I have this type of thing here where I have my red fiber and my green fiber. So I can take this family of Landau-Ginsberg models. This is the, and this will be the limit mixed hot structure of the family of Landau-Ginsberg models. given by taking W2, taking a fiber of W2 um, and equipping it with the function W1, restricted to that. All right, so I get a family of landau ginsberg models and I take the limit mixed hot structure at infinity of that. All right, so morally, that's what this third term is. So you have this exact sequence which relates the cohomology of, um, of the hybrid landau ginsberg model, which by this uh, first statement here is isomorphic to the cohomology of the sum of the two potential functions, to the, landau, to the cohomology of the landau ginsberg model with the single potential function, and the price you pay is the uh, limit mixed hot structure of the fibers of this family of landau ginsberg models. Um, but one of the nice things about this is that you can actually compute the uh, well, at least the Hodge graded piece here, because it's going to be the same as the dimensions of the Hodge graded pieces of the mixed Hodge structure on each fiber of this family of Landau Ginsberg models. Okay, so you can really reduce this to sort of easier computations. Um, so this is a good computational tool. I didn't get to my application, but that's life. Um, you can also build, you know, spectral sequences out of this data. So the breaking of this potential function is really useful uh, to, to sort of talk about how, how um, you know, how, how these invariants behave under splitting up a potential function. Okay, so that'll be it for, for, for now. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. So, so I mean, I, I, maybe I'll scroll to the last thing, which is, um, oh no, okay, maybe I won't. So, I, I don't know. So the idea is, are you asking me to explain the application? Okay, um, so the idea is that if I have a line bundle over uh, a Landau-Ginsberg model, I can build another Landau-Ginsberg model by taking the dual line bundle over the total space of that Y, equipping it with the potential function induced by a section of the original line bundle and pulling back my um, potential function on Y. So I build this hybrid landau ginsberg model from the data of a line bundle on Y, a potential function on Y, and a section on that line bundle. So, you know, sort of classically, it's, it's relatively well known that you can, um, uh, well, yeah, so, so this gives you a hybrid landau ginsberg model. And you can also, from the same data, you can construct a, um, a restriction of your Landau-Ginsberg data to the vanishing locus of sigma. Right? So you can build you know, two different Landau-Ginsberg models from this data. And so the theorem, which is basically an application of this you know, diagram, is that from this data, the two Landau-Ginsberg models that you construct have the same mixed Hodge structure up to a shift by negative one. Right? So in particular, this, uh, there's a construction of Gross, Katsarkov, and Rudat for um, uh, mirrors to hypersurfaces and torque varieties, which increases dimension by one. And this is that's sort of an application here. So this tells you that you can actually bring this, this construction back down to earth. You can bring it down to sort of, OK, I'm not saying anything super meaningful at this point. So you, th this, 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 this is sort of a nice uh, application in certain cases. Um, I, I'm happy to explain more if anyone wants that. Otherwise, yeah. So, in your generalized Sebastian, you have two potential and the existing one potential. I mean, if you have a two random window model, mm -hmm. and then I think if you have two monodromy, monodromy. Structure and if you make this into one potential, then yeah. one. May I ask you how these two monodromies, one monodromy different? Yeah, uh, so the one monodromy is the sum of the two monodromies. Uh, so yeah. Simply... yeah. So it's the same thing like if you go back to the mirror situation where you, you break your boundary divisor into two pieces, you have two different operators coming from product with the two divisors. 
and the sum of the cup product with the anticanonical or whatever, you know, it's, it's the same idea. So monodromy around each boundary device around each, um, each uh, with respect to each potential should correspond to cut product with the corresponding boundary divisors. Yeah. Um, that should work arbitrarily. Yeah. I I don't know precisely, but I mean, the construction that I gave is at least like, I, I, I'd be surprised if it couldn't, but I haven't thought about that. I think Sukju's thought about that a little bit. Um, and I think he, from what I saw, he's worked out examples of this. So Sukju Lee, um, he's worked out examples of this where he's made the statement that these are, these respect symplectic structures, yes. So I, I think probably, Any other question? Okay, now let's thanks to Colin.